from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering NextWork 2019 Americas. Brought to you by Juniper Networks. Welcome back everybody, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Las Vegas at Caesars at the Juniper NextWork event. About a thousand people kind of going over a lot of new cool things. 400 gigs, who knew that was coming? I, uh, new information for me. But that's not what we're here today. We're here for the fourth installment of Around the Cube, Unpacking AI. And we're happy to have all the winners of the three previous rounds here at the same place. We didn't have to do it over the phone. Uh, so we're happy to have him, and let's jump into it. So winner of round one was Bob Friday. He is the VP and CTO at MIST, the Juniper Company. Bob, great to see you. Yeah, good to be back. Absolutely, all the way uh, from Seattle, Sharna Parkey. She's a VP Applied Scientist at Textio. Good yeah. to see you, Sharna. Good to see you. And uh, from Google, we know a lot of AI happens at Google, uh, Rajan Sheth, he is the VP AI Product Management at Google. Welcome. Thank you, great to be here. All right, so let's jump into it. So just to warm everybody up, and we'll start with you, Bob. What are some, when you're talking to someone uh, at a cocktail party, Friday night, talking to your mom, and they say, what is AI? What do you give them as an example of where AI is impacting our lives today? Well, I mean, I think we all know the examples of the self-driving car, and, you know, AI is starting to help our healthcare industry being diagnosed cancer. Uh, for me personally, I had kind of a weird experience last week at a retail technology event where basically we had these new digital mirrors doing facial recognition, right? And basically you start to have digital mirrors who are going to basically start guessing, hey, you have a beard, you have some glasses, and they start calling me old. <laughs> you know, so this is kind of very personal when I have AI. It's one thing for you to call me old, but AI, you know, walking down a mall with a bunch of mirrors calling me old, that's a little annoying. <laughs> well, did it bring you out like a cane or a walker yeah, or a no, yeah. scooter started, or anything? Yeah, it started giving me some advertisings that were like, okay, you guys, this is a little bit uh, <laughs> over the top. All right, Sharna, what about you? What's your favorite example to share with people? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of my favorite examples of AI is um, kind of accessible and on your phone where the photos you take on an iPhone, the photos you put in Google Photos, they're automatically detecting the faces and they're labeling them for you. They're like, here's selfies, here's your family, here's your children, and you know, that's the most accessible one. Um, the ones that I think people don't really think about a lot are things like getting loan applications, right? We actually have AI deciding whether or not we get loans, and that one is is probably the most interesting one to me right now. <laughs> Raja? So I think the photos example is probably my favorite as well, and what's interesting to me is that really, AI is actually not about the AI, it's about the user experience that, that you can create as a result of AI. And what's cool about Google Photos is that you know, my entire family uses Google Photos, and they don't even know, actually, that the underlying is some of the most powerful AI in the world. But what they know is they can find every picture of our kids on the beach uh, whenever they whenever they, they want to. Or, you know, we had a great example where, you know, we, we with our kids, every time they like something in the store, we take a picture of it, um, and we can look up toy and actually find everything that, the, that they've taken a picture of. It's interesting because I think uh, most people don't even know the power that they have because if you search for beach um, in your Google Photos or you search for, uh, I was looking for an old bug picture from my high school, there, it, it came right up. So until you kind of explore, you know, it's pretty tricky. So Rajan, you know, I think a lot of conversation about AI, they always focus on the general purpose, general yeah. purpose, general purpose machines and, and robots and computers. But, but people don't really talk about the applied AI that's happening all around us. Why do you think that's so? It's a good question. There's, there's a lot more talk about kind of that general purpose, but the reality of where this has an impact right now is the, are those spe specific use cases. And so, you know, for example, things like personalizing customer interaction or uh, spotting trends that, that, that you wouldn't have spotted before or turning unstructured data like documents into structured data, that's where AI is actually having an impact right now. And I think it really boils down to getting to the right use cases where AI can add value. Right. Sharon, I wanted to ask you, you know, there's a lot of conversation always, does AI replace people or is it an augmentation for people? And we had Gary Kasparov on a couple years ago and he talked about, you know, it was the combination of he plus the computer made mm -hmm. the best chess player, but that quickly went away. Now the computer's actually better than Gary Kasparov plus the, the computer. How should yeah. people think about AI as an augmentation tool versus a replacement tool and is it just going to be specific to the application? How do you kind of think about those? Yeah, I would say that any application where you're making life and death decisions, where you're making financial decisions that disadvantage people, anything where you know, you've know you got UAVs and you're deciding whether or not to actually drop the bomb, like you need a human in the loop. 
if you're trying to change the words that you are using to get a different group of people to apply for jobs, you need a human in the loop. Because it turns out that, uh, for the example of beach, you type sheep into your phone and you might get just a field, a green field. And AI doesn't know that uh, you know, if it's always seen sheep in a field, that when the sheep aren't there, that that isn't a sheep. Like it doesn't have that kind of recognition to it. So anything where we're making decisions about parole or financial, anything like that needs to have human in the loop um, because those types of decisions are changing fundamentally the way we live. Great. So shift gears, the team, uh, or did you have something, Bob? No, no, I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the team reminded me I have, I've been uh, delinquent <laughs> on my bell, so I'll be uh, more active on the bell. Sorry about that. <laughs> so everyone's even. We're starting at zero again. So I want to shift gears and talk about data sets. Um, mm -hmm. Bob, you were up on stage uh, demoing some, some of your technology, the MIST technology, and really, you know, it's interesting, a combination of data sets. AI, in its current form, needs a lot of data. Again, kind of the classic Chihuahua and Blueberry, in photos, you got to run a lot of them through. How do you think about data sets in terms of having the right data and a complete data set to drive an algorithm? Yeah, I mean, I think we all know data sets was one of the tipping points for AI to become more real, right? Along with cloud compute and storage. Uh, but data is really one of the key points of making AI real, right? And my example on stage was wine, right? Great wine starts with great grapes, great AI starts with great data. Uh, for us personally, LSTM is an example in our networking space where we have data for the last three months from our customers, and we're really using the last 30 days to really train these LSTM algorithms to really get that tsunami detection to a point where we don't have false positives. How much of the training is done once, you, once you've gone through the data a couple times and, and adjust versus when you first start and you're not really sure how it's going to shake out in the algorithm? Yeah, so in our case right now, right, training happens every night. So every night we're basically retraining those models basically to be able to predict if there's going to be an anomaly in your network. You know, and this is really an example where you look at you know, all these other cat image things. This is where these neural networks are really were one of the transformational things that really moved AI into the reality column. Um, mm. And it's starting to impact all our different energy, whether it's text, imaging. Uh, and in the networking world, it's an example where even AI and deep learning is really starting to impact our networking customers. Yeah. Sharon, I want to go to you. What do you do if you don't have a big data set? You don't have lots of pictures of chihuahuas and, and blackberries, and I want to apply some machine intelligence to the problem. I mean, so you need to have the right data set. I, you know, big is a, a relative term, um, and it depends on what you're using it for, right? So you can have a massive amount of data that represents solar flares, and then you're trying to detect some anomaly, right? If you train an AI what normal is based upon a massive amount of data, and you don't have enough examples of that anomaly you're trying to detect, then it's never going to say there's an anomaly there. So you actually need to oversample. You have to create a population of data uh, that allows you to detect images. You can't say, um, oh, I'm going to reflect in my data set the percentage of black women in Seattle, which is something below 6%, and say it's fair. It's not, right? You have to be able to oversample things that you need. And in some ways, you can get this through surveys, you can get it through um, actually going to different sources, but you have to bootstrap it in some way, and then you have to refresh it. Because if you leave that data set static, like Bob mentioned, like you, people are changing the way they do attacks in networks all the time. And so you may have been able to find the one yesterday, but today it's a completely different ball game. Rajan, to you, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you start with the data and I say this is a ripe uh, opportunity to apply some AI, or do you have some AI uh, uh, objectives that you want to achieve and now you got to go out and find the data? So actually I think what starts, where it starts is the business problem you're trying to solve. Um, and then from there you need to have the right data. What's interesting uh, about this is that you can actually have starting points. And so for example, there's uh, techniques uh, around transfer learning where mm -hmm. you're able to take a, an algorithm that's already been trained on a bunch of data and train it a little bit further with, with your data. Um, and so we've seen that such that you know people that may have, for example, only 100 images of something, but they can use a, a, a model that's trained on millions of images and only use those 100 to, uh, to create something that it's actually quite accurate. So that's a great segue, give you a ring on that one. <laughs> it's a great segue into talking about applying one algorithm that was built around one data set and then applying it to a different data set. 
is that appropriate? Is that correct? Is, are, are you risking all kinds of interesting problems by taking that and applying it here, especially in light of when people are going to go to algorithm marketplaces? Because I'm not a data scientist. I can go get one in a marketplace and apply it to my data. How should people be careful not to make a bad decision based on that? So I, I think it really depends, and uh, it depends on the, t the, the type of uh, machine learning that you're doing and what type of data uh, you're talking about. So for example, with images, there, there, there are uh, well-known techniques to be able to uh, do this, but with other things, there aren't really, and so it really depends. But then the other, inter the other really important thing is that no matter what, at the end, you need to test and iterate based on your uh, based on your data sets and uh, and and based on sample data uh, to see if it's accurate or not, and uh, and then that's going to guide everything ultimately. Sharon, I was going to go to you. you. You brought up something in the preliminary rounds mm. about um, open AI and kind mm. of this, we can't have this black box where stuff goes into the algorithm and stuff comes out and we're not sure what the result was. Sounds really important, is that, is that even plausible? Is it mm -hmm. feasible? This is crazy statistics, crazy math. You, know, you talked about the business objective that someone's trying to achieve. I go to the data scientist, here's my data, you're telling me this is the output. How, you know, kind of where's the line between the layman and the business person and the hardcore data science to bring together the knowledge of here's what's making the algorithm say this? Yeah, there's a lot of names for this, whether it's explainable AI or interpretable AI or opening the black box, things like that. Um, the algorithms that you use determine whether or not they're inspectable. Um, and the, the deeper your neural network gets, the harder it is to inspect, actually, right? So uh, to your point, every time you take an AI and you use it in a different scenario than what it was built for, for example, um, there was a a police precinct in New York that had a facial recognition software and uh, a victim said, oh, it looked like this actor. This person looked like, I don't know, Bill Cosby or something like that. And you were never supposed to take an image of an actor and put it in there to find people that look like them. But that's how people were using it. So to Rajan's point, yes, like it, you can transfer learning to other AIs, but it's actually the humans that are using it in ways that are unintended that we have to be more careful about, right? Um, even if uh, your AI is explainable and somebody tries to use it in a way that it was never intended to be used, the risk is much higher. Yeah, I think maybe I'd add, you know, you know, if you look at Marvis, kind of what we're building for the networking community, uh, a good example is when Marvis tries to do, estimate your throughput, right, your internet throughput. Uh, that's what we use what we call a decision tree algorithm. And that's a very interpretive algorithm, and when we predict low throughput, we know how we got to that answer, right? We know what features got us there. You know, but when we're doing something like anomaly detection, that's a neural network. You know, mm -hmm. it's a black box that tells us, yes, there's a problem, there's some anomaly, but it doesn't know what caused the anomaly. But that's a case where we actually use neural networks to actually find the anomaly, and then we're using something else to find the root cause. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really depends on the use case and whether or not you're going to use an interpretive model or a neural network, which is more of a black box model to tell you you've got a cat or you've got a problem somewhere. So Bob, that's really interesting. So can you not unpack a neural network? Is just the nature of the way that the communication and the, and the data flows and the inferences are made that you can't go in and unpack it, that you have to have this separate kind of process to get to the root cause? Yeah, you know, as a scientist, it's always hard to say never, but inherently, yes. Neural networks are a very complicated set of, set of weights, right? It's basically usually a supervised training model and we're feeding it a bunch of data and trying to train it to detect a certain feature, a certain output. Uh, but that is where they're powerful, right? And that's why they basically are doing such a good job because they are mimicking the brain, right? That neural network is a very complex thing. Um, it's kind of like your brain, right? We really don't understand how your brain works right now. When you have a problem, it's really trial and error when we try to figure out right, what's going right. on. So I, I want to stay with you, Bob, for a minute. So what about when you change what you're optimizing for? So you just said you're, you're optimizing for throughput of the network, you're looking for problems. Now let's just say it's uh, end, of the, end of the quarter. So some other reason where now you're changing, you're changing what you're optimizing for. Can you, do you have to write a separate algorithm? Can you have dynamic uh, movement inside that algorithm? How do you approach that problem? Because you're not always optimizing for the same things, depending on the market conditions. Yeah, I mean, I think a good example, you know, again with Marvis is really with uh, what we call reinforcement learning, right? And reinforcement learning is a model we use for like radio resource management. And there we're really trying to optimize for the user experience and trying to balance the reward. The model's trying to reward whether or not we have a good balance between the network and the user, right? 
uh, that reward can be changed. So that algorithm is basically reinforcement. You can fundamentally change how that algorithm works by changing the reward you give the algorithm. Great. Um, Rajan, back to you. A couple of huge things have, have come into, into play in the marketplace. Get your take. One is open source. You know, kind of what's the impact of open source generally on the availability to use AI in more applications. And then two, cloud and soon to be edge, you know, the current next stop. How do, how do you guys incorporate that opportunity? How does it change what you can do? How does it open up the lens of AI? Yeah, I think open source is really important because I think one thing that's interesting about AI is that it's a very nascent field and the more that there's open source, the more that people can build on top of each other and be able to utilize what, what others, uh, others have done. And it's similar to how we've seen open source impact operating systems, the internet, things like, uh, things like that. With cloud, I think one of the big things with cloud is now you have the processing power and the ability to, to access lots of data to be able to, uh, to, to create these, uh, these networks. And so the capacity for data and the capacity for compute uh, is, is much higher. Edge is going to be a very important thing, especially going into the next uh, few years. You're seeing more things incorporated on the edge, and one exciting development is around federated learning, where you can train on the edge and then combine some of those aspects into a cloud-side model. And so that, I think, will actually um, make edge even more powerful. But it's got to be so dynamic, right? Because the fundamental problem used to always be, do you move the compute to the data or the data to the compute? Well now you've got, on these edge devices, you've got ton of data, right? Sensor data, all kinds of machine data. You've got potentially nasty hostile conditions. You're not in a nice pristine data center where the environmental conditions are and the connectivity issues. So when you think about that problem, yet there's still great information there. You've got latency issues. Some might have to be processed close to home. How do you incorporate that age old thing of the speed of light to still break, the, break up the problem to give you a step yeah. up? What we see a lot of customers do is they do a lot of training on the cloud, but then inference on the, on the edge. And so that way, um, they're able to create the models that they want, but then they get fast response time by moving the model uh, to the edge. The other thing is that, like you said, lots of data is coming into the edge. Um, so one way to do it is to efficiently move that to the cloud, but the other way to do it is to filter and to try to figure out what data you want to send uh, to the cloud so that you can create the next data set. Sharana, back to you. Let's shift gears into ethics, this mm -hmm. pesky, pesky issue that's not a technological issue yeah. at all, but right, we see it often, especially in tech. Just because you should, just because you can, doesn't, doesn't mean that you should. You should. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and, and this is not a STEM issue, right? There, there's right. a lot of different things that happen. So, how should people be thinking about ethics? How should they incorporate mm -hmm. ethics? Yeah. Um, how should they make sure that they've got kind of a, you know, a standard kind of overlooking kind of yeah. what they're doing and the decisions are being made? Yeah, one of the more approachable ways that I've found to explain this is with uh, behavioral science methodologies. So ethics is a, a massive field of study and not everyone shares the same ethics. However, if you try and bring it closer to behavior change, because every product that we're building is seeking to change a behavior, we need to ask questions like, what is the gap between the person's intention and the goal we have for them. Would they choose that goal for themselves or not? If they wouldn't, then you have an ethical problem, right? And this, this can be true of the intention goal gap or the intention action gap. We can see when we regulated uh, for cigarettes, what we can't just make it look cool without telling them what the cigarettes are doing to them, right? So we can apply these same principles moving forward and they're pretty accessible without having to know, oh, this philosopher and that philosopher and this ethicist said these things. It can be pretty human. The challenge with this is that most people building these algorithms are not they're not trained in this way of thinking. And especially when you're working at a startup, right? you don't have access to massive teams of people to guide you down this journey. So you need to build it in from the beginning and you need to build it in based upon principles. Um, and it's going to touch every component. It should touch your data, your algorithm, the people that you're using to build the product. If you only have white men building the product, you have a problem you need to pull in other people. Right. Um, otherwise, there are just blind spots that you are not going to think of in order to build that product for a wider audience. But it, it seems like though we're on such a, sh a razor sharp edge, right? Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola wants you to buy Coca-Cola and they show ads for Coca-Cola mm -hmm. and they appeal to your, let's all sing together on the hillside and, and, and be one, mm -hmm. right? 
But it feels like with AI that, they're ch that, that is, now you can cheat, right? Now you can use behavioral biases that are hardwired into my brain as a biological creature mm -hmm. against me. And so where is, where is the fine line between just trying to get you to buy Coke, which some would argue is probably just as bad as Juul because you yep. get diabetes and all these other issues, but that's acceptable, but cigarettes, yeah are well, not, we and now we're seeing this stuff on Facebook yeah. where you know, they're coming right at you. Now, though, right, right? Right. So yeah. we know that this is bad. And Coke isn't just selling Coke anymore, they're also selling vitamin water. So their, their play isn't to have a single product that you can purchase, but it is to have a suite of products that if you want that Coke, you can buy it. But if you want that vitamin water, you can have that but you don't too. get vitamin water and a yeah. smile. That only comes with the Coke, though. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I, Bob, you want to jump in? Yeah, because I, mean, I, I think we're going to see ethics really break into two different discussions, right? I mean. Ethics is already like human behavior that you're already doing, right? Doing bad behavior like discriminatory hiring, mm -hmm. you know, training that behavior into AI is going to be wrong. It's mm -hmm. wrong in the human world, it's going to be wrong in the AI world. I think the other component to this ethics discussion is really around privacy of data. It's like that mirror example, right? Mm -hmm. You know, who gave that mirror the right to basically tell me I'm old and actually do something with that data, right? You know, is that my data or is that the mirror's data that basically recognized me and basically did something with it, right? You know, that's the Facebook example when I get the email telling me, look at that picture, and someone's tagged me in the picture. It's like, you know, where, was that, where did that come from? Right, but I'm curious about the follow up on that. As social norms change, we talked about it a little bit before we turned the cameras on, right? It used to be okay to have, you know, no black people drinking out of a fountain or coming in the side door of a restaurant. It, not that long ago, right, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So. If someone had built an algorithm then, that would have incorporated probably that oh. social norm, but social norms change. So how should we you know, kind of try to stay ahead yeah. of that or at least go back reflectively yeah. after the fact and say kind of back to the black box, oop, that's no longer acceptable. We need well, to tweak this thing. I, I would have said in that example, that was wrong 50 years ago. Yep. <laughs> it was not okay. It, it was ago. wrong, it was but wrong, if you ask somebody uh, in Alabama, you know, at, at the University of Alabama math department, who've been born, red, red. And, and born and bred in that culture, is whole what you know they probably would have yeah. not necessarily agreed. But yeah. so generally, though, again, a, assuming things change, how should we make sure to go back and make sure that we're yeah. not again carrying well, forward things that are no longer the right thing to do? Well, I think, I mean, as I said, I think you know what what we know is wrong you know, is going to be wrong in the AI world. I think the more subtle thing is when we start relying on these AI to make decisions like, you know, should my car hit the pedestrian or save my life? You know, those are tough decisions to let a machine take off or your bomb yeah. decision, right? Yeah. Yeah. When we start letting the machines or, you know, is it okay for Marvis to give this VIPs preference over other people, right? You know, those type of decisions are kind of the ethical decisions. You know whether right and wrong in the human world, uh, I think the same thing will apply in the AI world. I do think we'll start to see more regulation, just like we see regulation happen in our hiring. You know, that regulation is going to be applied into our AI right. solutions. We're going to come back to regulation in a minute, but Raj, I want to follow up with you. In your uh, earlier session, you, you, you made an interesting comment. You said, you know, 10% is clearly, you know, good. 10% uh, is clearly bad, but it's the soft, squishy middle at 80% that aren't necessarily super clear, good or bad. So how should people you know, kind of make judgments in this, this big gray area in the middle? Yeah, and I, I think that is the toughest part. And so w the approach that we've taken is to set, a, set out a set of AI principles. Um, and what we did is actually wrote down seven things that we, will, that, uh, that we think AI should do and four things that we should not do, that we will not do. Um, and we now have to actually look at everything that we're doing um, against those AI principles. And so part of that is coming up with that governance process because ultimately it boils down to doing this over and over, seeing lots of cases and figuring out what, uh, what you should do. Um, and so that governance process is something we're doing, but I think it's something that every company is going to need to do. Sharon, I want to come back to you. Uh, as, so we're going to shift gears to talk a little bit about, about law. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen uh, Zuckerberg, unfortunately for him, has been you know, stuck in these congressional hearings over and over and over mm -hmm. again. A little bit of a deer in a headlight. And you made an interesting comment on your prior show that it, it, he's almost like he's asking for regulation. Yeah. Like, you know, he stumbled into some really big, hairy, nasty areas that were never necessarily intended when they launched Facebook out of his dorm room many, many moons ago. Um, so what is the role 
of yeah. the law. Because the other thing that we've seen, unfortunately, in a lot of those hearings is a lot of our elected officials are way, way, way behind. They're still printing their emails, right? Yep. So what is the role of the law? How should we think about it? What should we, what should we invite from, from the law to help? sort some of this stuff out. Yeah, I, I think um, as an individual, right, I would like for each company not to make up their own set of principles. I would like to have a shared set of principles that we're following. The challenge, right, is that with between governments, that's impossible. China is never going to come up with the same regulations that we will. They have a different privacy standards than we do. Um, but we are seeing locally, like the state of Washington has created a future of work task force, and they are coming into the private sector and asking companies like Textio and like Google and Microsoft to actually advise them on what should we be regulating. We don't know, we're not the technologists, but they know how to regulate and they know how to, to move policies through the government. What we'll find is if we don't advise regulators on what we should be regulating, they're going to regulate it in some way, just like they regulated the tobacco industry, just like they regulated sort of um, uh, monopolies, that tech is big enough now. There is enough money in it now that it will be regulated. Right, right. And so we need to start advising them on what we should regulate, because just like Mark, he said, well, everyone else was doing it. My competitors were doing it. So if you don't want me to do it, make us all stop. Yeah, I think <laughs> Can I do a negative bell on that one? Not for you, but for Mark's response to me, that's crazy. So, so Bob, old man at the mall, uh, th it's actually a little bit more codified, right? There's GDPR, which came mm. through May of last year, and now the new one is the California, make sure I get it right, California Consumer mm, Protection yeah. Act, which goes into effect January 1. And you know, it's interesting, is that the hardest part of the implementation of that, I think, I haven't implemented it, mm. is the right to be forgotten. Because as we all know, computers are really good at recording yep. information, in cloud it's recorded everywhere, there's no there there. So when these types of regulations, um, how does that impact AI? Because if I've got an algorithm built on a data set and, and person, you know, item number uh, 472 decides they want to be forgotten, how the heck do I deal with that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think with, with Facebook, I kind of see that as, I, think, I suspect Mark knows what's right and wrong. He's just kicking the ball down tires. Like, oh, you guys, it's your problem. You know, please tell me what to do. Um, I see AI as kind of like any other new technology. You know, it can be abused and used in the wrong ways. Uh, I think legally, we have a constitution that protects our rights. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see the lawyers treat AI just like any other constitutional things. And people who are building products using AI, just like we build medical products mm -hmm. or other products and particularly harmful people, you're going to have to make sure that your AI product does not harm people, your AI product does not include, you know, in, uh, promote discriminatory results. Uh, so I think we're going to see, you know, our constitutional thing is going to apply to AI just like we've seen other technologies right. in work. And it's going to create jobs because of that, right? Because... Yeah, so it'll be a whole new set of lawyers. A whole new set of lawyers <laughs> and, and testers <laughs> even because otherwise if an individual yeah. company is saying, oh, we tested it, it works, trust us. Like, how are you going to get the independent third party verification of that? Right. So we're going to start to see a whole proliferation uh, of that type of field that never had to exist before. Yeah, one of my favorites, Dr. Ruman Chowdhury from Accenture. If you don't follow her on yeah. Twitter, follow yeah. her. She's fantastic and, she and uh, great lady. So I want to stick with you uh, for a minute, Bob, because the next topic is autonomous. And Raman up on the keynote this morning talked about MIST and, and, and really this kind of shifting workload of fixing things into an autonomous setup where the system now is, is finding problems, diagnosing problems, fixing problems up to, I think he said even generating uh, return authorization for broken yeah. gear, which is amazing. But autonomy opens up all kinds of crazy, scary things. Um, Robert Gates, we interviewed, said, you know, the only guns that are that are autonomous in the entire U.S. military are the ones on the, the border of North Korea. Every single other one has to run through a person. So when you think about autonomy and when you can actually grant this, this AI, the, the autonomy, the agency to act, what are some of the things to think about and what are the things to keep from just doing something bad really, really fast and efficiently? Yeah, I mean, I think this is what we discussed, right? I mean, I think, you know, from a practical purposes, we're a far, you know, we're, we're, there is a tipping point. I think eventually we will get to the CP30 Terminator day where we actually build something that's uh, on par with a human. Uh, but for the real purposes right now, we're really looking at tools that are going to help businesses, doctors, self-driving cars. And those tools are going to be used by our customers to basically allow them to do more productive things with their time. You know, whether it's a doctor that's using a tool to actually use AI 
to predict, you know, help make better predictions, there's still going to be a human involved. You know, and what Rami talked about this morning in networking is really allowing our IT customers focus more on their business problems where they don't have to spend their time finding bad hardware, bad software, and making better experiences for the people they're actually trying to serve. Right. Trying to get your take on, on autonomy, because it's a different level of trust that we're giving to the machine when we actually let it do things based on its own volition. Yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes into this decision of whether or not to allow autonomy. There's an example I read, there's a book that just came out, um, oh, what's the title? Um, you Look Like a Thing and I Love You. It was a book named by yeah. an AI. Um, if you want to learn a lot about AI um, and you don't know much about it, get it, it's really funny. Um, so in there, there is in China uh, a factory where the AI is optimizing um, output of cockroaches. Now they just they want more cockroaches. Now why do they want that? They want to grind them up and put them in uh, uh, like a lotion. It's one of their secret ingredients. Now it depends on what parameters you allow that AI to change, right? If you decide to let the AI flood the container and then the cockroaches get out through the vents and then they get to the kitch kitchen to get food and then they reproduce, the parameters in which you let them be autonomous over is the challenge. So when we're working with very narrow AI, when you tell the AI you can change these three things and you can't just change anything, then it's a lot easier to make that autonomous decision. Um, and then the, the last part of it is that um, you want to know what is the result of a negative outcome, right? There, what's the result of a positive outcome? And are those results something that we can take? actually. Right, right. Raj, I'll give you the last word on autonomy because kind of the next order uh, of, of, of step is where the, the machines actually write their own algorithms, right? They start to write their own code. So they, they kind of take this next order uh, of thought and agency, if you will. How do you guys think about that? You guys are way out ahead uh, in this space. You have huge data sets, you got great technology, you got TensorFlow. When will the machines start writing their own, their own algorithms? Well, and I, Actually, it's it's already starting there. That uh, you know, for example, we have we have a product called uh, Google Cloud AutoML, which basically mm -hmm. takes in a data set and then we find the best model to be able to match uh, that data set. And so things like that 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 are there uh, already, but it's still very nascent. There's a lot more that uh, that can happen. And I think ultimately, with uh, with how it's used. I think part of it is you have to start to always look at the downside of automation and what is what is the downside of a bad decision, whether it's the wrong algorithm that you create or a bad decision in, in, in that model. And so if the downside is really big, that's where you need to start to apply a human in the loop. And so for example, in medicine, AI can do amazing things to detect diseases, but you would want a doctor in the loop to be able mm -hmm. to actually diagnose. And so you need to have, uh, have that in place in many situations to make sure uh, that it's being applied well. But is that just today or is that tomorrow? Because you know, with, with exponential growth and, and, and as fast as these things are growing, I mean, will there be a day where you don't necessarily need, to, maybe need the doctor to communicate the news, maybe there's some second order impacts in terms of how you deal with the family and you know, kind of pros and cons of treatment options that are more emotional than necessarily mechanical. Yeah. Because it seems like eventually, that the, 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 the doctor has a role, but it isn't necessarily in accurately diagnosing a problem. I think, it, I think for some things, absolutely. Um, over time, the algorithms will get better and better and you can rely on them and trust them uh, more and more. But again, I think you have to look at the downside consequence that if there's a bad decision, what happens and how is that compared to what happens today? And so that's really where, where, uh, where that is. So for example, self-driving cars, we will get to the point where cars are driving by themselves. There will be accidents, but the accident rate is going to be much lower than what's there with humans today. And so that will get there, but it will yeah. take time. Yeah. Yeah, there is a day when it'll be illegal for you to drive. Yes. It'll be a manslaughter, right? I, I, I believe absolutely there will be. And, and, and I don't think it's that far off, actually. Yeah, and, and I'm waiting. Um, I, I'm waiting for the day when I can have my car take me up to Northern California with me sleeping. That is the day. <laughs> I'm hoping I live that long. That's right. And work while, yes. you're, uh, while you're sleeping. All right, well, I, I want to thank everybody a ton for being on this panel. This has been super fun, and these are really big issues. So I want to give you the, the final word. We'll just give everyone kind of a final 
say, and, and I just want to throw out there a Mars Law. I mean, people talk about Moore's Law all the time, but a Mars Law, which Gartner stole and made into the hype cycle, you know, is that we tend to overestimate in the short term, which is why you get the hype cycle, and we turn, tend to underestimate in the long term, the impacts of technology. So I just want to, as, as you look forward in the future, we won't put a year number on it, you know, kind of how do you see this rolling out? What are you excited about? What are you scared about? What should we be thinking about? We'll start with you, Bob. Yeah, you know, for me, you know, the day of the Terminator CP0, I don't know if it's 100 years or 1,000 years, that day is coming. You know, we will eventually build something that's on par of the human. Uh, I think the mention about the book, you know, you look like a thing and I love you mm -hmm. type of thing, that was written by someone who tried to train AI to basically uh, pick up lines, right? Cheesy mm -hmm. pickup lines. Yeah. Uh, I'm not for sure I'm going to trust AI to help me with my pickup lines yet. You know, you know, I love you, you, know, you look like a thing, I love you, I don't know, it may work. It's kind of uh, cute. Yeah, but who would have guessed <laughs> online dating is, yeah. is what it uh, is if you had asked you know, 15 years ago. But I think, yes, yeah, so I think overall, yes, we will see the Terminator CP3, it's probably not in our lifetime, but it is, it's in the future somewhere. Uh, AI is definitely going to be on par with the internet, cell phone, radio. It's going to be a technology that's going to be accelerating. If you look at where technology's been over the last, it's just amazing to watch how fast things have changed in our lifetime alone, right? Yeah. You know, we're just on this curve of technology acceleration. It's just amazing. Exponential curves, Sharna. Yeah, I think the thing I'm most excited about for AI right now is the addition of creativity to a lot of our jobs. So. A lot of, we build an augmented writing product and what we do is we look at the words that have happened in the world and their outcomes and we tell you what words have impacted people in the past. Now, with that information, when you augment humans in that way, they get to be more creative. They get to use language that have never been used before to communicate an idea. You can do this with any field. You can do it with composition of music. You can. If, if you can have access as an individual to the data of a bunch of cultures, the way that we evolve can change. So I'm most excited about that. I think I'm most concerned uh, currently about the products that we're building to give AI to people that don't understand how to use it or how to make sure they're making an ethical decision. So it is extremely easy right now to go on the internet to build a model on a data set and I'm not a specialist in data, right? And so I have no idea if I'm adding bias in or not. Um, and so it's it's an interesting time because we're in that middle area. Um, and <laughs> it's getting loud. It's, it's getting, getting loud. loud. It's getting loud. All right, Roger, we'll just throw it to you before we have to cut out, or we're not going to be able to hear anything here yeah. in a few minutes. Uh, so I. I actually start every presentation out with a picture of the Mosaic browser. Uh, because what's interesting is I think that's where AI is today, uh, compared to kind of when the, when the internet was around 1994. Hmm. We're just starting to see how AI can actually impact the average person. As a result, there's a lot of hype, but what I'm actually finding is that 70% of the companies I talk to, the first question is, why should I be using this and what benefit does it give me? Why? 70% ask you why. Yeah, and, wow. and, and what's interesting with that is that I, I think people are still trying to figure out what is this stuff good for? But to your point about the long run, and, and we underestimate the long run, I think that every company out there and every product will be fundamentally transformed by AI over the course of the next decade. Mm -hmm. And it's actually going to have a bigger impact than the internet itself. And so that's really what we have to look forward to. All right, again, thank you everybody for participating. That was a ton of fun. I hope you had some fun. As I look at the score sheet here, we've got Bob uh, coming in in the bronze at 15 points, Rajan at 17, and our gold medal winner for the silver bell <laughs> is Sharna at 20 points again. Yay. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, look forward to our next conversation. Yeah. Me too. All right, Thanks. Jeff Riggs signing out from Caesars, Juniper Next Work, Unpacking AI. Thanks for watching.